in the presence of the Lord, in the presence of the Lord. God. Aren't you glad for the presence of the Lord? It can make a difference in our lives. Praise God. You can be seated. We're in, I guess they call it lesson 3-2 uh, in, your, in your Sunday school book. And um, talking about discipleship, what we need for discipleship. We're going to talk about spiritual direction this morning. Talked about vision last week. Direction comes once we get some vision. And um, we're going to read in Acts chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. If you'll follow along with me. Now, there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Manian, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul, and they ministered to the Lord and fasted, and the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Saul, or Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereinto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So if you put this in context with the rest of Scripture, we find that after the Holy Ghost had been poured out on the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem, the gospel message, which is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, began to spread, began to spread to, to other places around the world. There were 120 people that were in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. That same day, when they spilled out into the streets, the Bible said there were 3,000 added to the church in Jerusalem. So it was inevitable that the fire that was ignited in the upper room would eventually consume the known world. And the new worlds that were yet to be known. It was a message. This gospel message was a message that defies time and space. It's the same message today that it was on the day of Pentecost. I, it's I, you know, I, I'm doing a, I'm, I do HVAC work, and uh, I design uh, systems for homes. So I've got a builder that I work with. There is an area of town called Meridian Kesslerwood. Everybody know where Meridian Kesslerwood is? Really big old homes, uh, scary homes. We walked in, and uh, this house was empty. I, I don't know how many square feet it is. It's massive. And uh, the guy that was going to do the work with me said, are there ghosts in here? <laughs> I mean, it just looks like, you know, when I was a kid growing up, there used to be a show on TV called Dark Shadows. And it came on at 3.30, and we got out of school at 3.25. And uh, me and my brother and Brody and Brad Houston and Ricky and Randy Bartley would run home so that we could be home in time to watch all of that scary stuff. Uh, this house could have been in that show. It's that kind of a big stately place. On the wall, I, I, wish, I, I wish I'd have thought about it. I didn't think about it till just now. Um, on the wall, in the, in the hallways, is a little thing that's about this big. It's got a little microphone on it and a little round thing about that big on a cord. And I showed my grandkids. I'm going to pull it up on my phone because I took pictures of it. The 
you really won't get a great view of it, but um, I showed my grandkids this picture, and I asked them, do you know what this is? They didn't have a clue. You really can't see it real well, but I, I'll just walk down the aisle, and you can see. Uh, I asked my grandkids, do you know what that is? They didn't have a clue. They didn't have a clue. Uh, they have painted it all up, but it's an old, old wall phone. And uh, I said, it's a phone. And DJ said, what are the buttons for? And I said, you had to push the buttons to make it. You see it? Can you all see it back here? You had to push the buttons to make it talk. And he said, what's the red button for? And I said, well, that stops the talk. Uh, technology has changed. You know, that was a phone 60 years ago. Phones don't look like that now. There's a big Facebook meme. It's a big funny thing on Facebook about a, about a, uh, it's, a it's either a wall phone or it's sitting on a table, a telephone with a handset. You know, and these kids are trying to figure out how to use the crazy thing. Um, my dad was a funny character. Uh, when when technology came out, you know, there were always, when it started coming out, there were always two. There were VHS tapes and beta tapes, right? Guess which one my dad bought? Beta. beta. Always beta. There was the, the, the games that uh, there was in television, which is what my dad bought, and then the other one that everybody, that everybody else bought, Atari. Everybody else bought Atari, and my dad bought in television. So he wasn't real good at choosing which technology we should get. So we never, uh, we had cool stuff that nobody else in the neighborhood had. Uh, you know, nobody else had it, but man, we had it. Technology changes. A lot of things change. The gospel has never changed. Never changes. And so um, it was a message that defied space and even time. It overcame every barrier. Uh, it reached beyond the disciples' wildest dreams, and they were really not really a, a, very well aware of what was going to come, but they still walked every day in God's presence and God's power. So as we then approach Acts chapter 13 in the text, there was change that was in the air, not in the message, but in who the message went to, because prior to this, it had really been a message that was to the Jews. Uh, Stephen had been martyred. A lot of the believers had been scattered because of persecution. The church had been limited to witnessing the Jews. But when the word spread that Peter had gone to Cornelius' house and that all of Cornelius' household got the Holy Ghost, then the church realized that the gospel really was for the whole world. So... After scattering from Jerusalem, the men of Cyprus and Cyrene found themselves in Antioch where they encountered Grecians, Gentiles. And when they shared the gospel with them in Acts chapter 11 and verse 21, the Bible says a great many of them believed and turned unto the Lord. So when the church of Jerusalem heard of this outpouring, they were a little skeptical, didn't really know what was going on. They didn't trust Gentiles. So they sent Barnabas to Antioch to see what in the world was going on. Barnabas witnessed the grace of God, preached to him, and then he moved towards the idea that he should search out for Paul because Paul had a Roman citizenship and a Jewish citizenship. So Paul could be all things to all men. So he, he searched out for Paul, and, and these two went back to Antioch, and the Bible says, for a whole year, they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. That's in Acts chapter 11, verse 26. So this idea that was born in an atmosphere of prayer and worship and fasting, that's what we read in Acts chapter 13, right? It was born in, in, in prayer and worship and fasting. The Antioch church caught a vision of a broader harvest field than the Jewish church had caught. And a man named Agabus, a prophet from Jerusalem, had received a word. I don't know whether it was a dream or whether it was a vision or whatever, that the brethren in Judea needed support. And when he got that revelation, the people of the church of Antioch rallied 
and supported the needs of the people in Jerusalem. So when the Gentiles got the gospel message, they became financial backers for what was going on in Jerusalem, which lends more credence then to these Gentiles being part of the church of the living God because we read in the early part of the church of, of, uh, in the book of Acts that these Jews, when they received the gospel, they sold everything that they had, put all their, all their money in a big pot, gave it to the apostles and said, whatever needs to be passed out, you pass it out. You dole it out. You take care of it. Uh, and they took care of one another. They helped one another. Uh, that's not my message this morning. The point is, though, that when they saw that the Greece, the Grecians, these Gentiles, were also willing to do whatever it took to help spread the gospel, they realized that Jesus Christ had changed their lives. So when they, when they got to Antioch and they were praying and they were fasting on what should happen, the Lord instructed them in, in, in the second verse, we read it, it's on the screen still. As they ministered, they, they prayed and fasted and worshipped. Separate me, Paul and Barnabas, for the work whereunto I have called them. Anything we're ever going to get from God is not going to come from our programs. It's not going to come from flashy sermons. It's not going to come from having a cool pastor. It's just not. It's going to come by prayer and by fasting and by worship. The basis of our lives as Christians is prayer, fasting, and worship. And when we get tired of prayer and fasting and worship, you know what we do? We pray, we fast, and we worship. Because that's where our strength comes from. Every one of us are going to go through times of question. Every one of us are going to go through times of trial. Every one of us are going to go through storms. And when we go through those times, if we've prayed and we've fasted and we've worshipped, we'll get through it. If we don't get through those times of trial and of tribulation and of trouble in our life, there is always one foolproof answer that the pastor can say why you didn't get through the problem. Because you didn't pray, you didn't fast. And you didn't worship. Prayer and fasting and worship will take us through. Don't question God when we pray and we fast and we worship. Because we know that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord. I don't know that he called according to his purpose. I don't understand how it's good. I don't know why God makes us go through some of the things we have to go through. I don't know why the church has to suffer the persecution that it suffers. I don't always have the answer to the end of the situation. But I know that if I'll pray and I'll fast and I'll worship, God will take us through. Because God has a plan. God has direction for us. And we find our direction through having a vision. That's how we get it. God gives spiritual vision. Spiritual vision accompanied with prayer gives birth to spiritual direction. God will prepare us in prayer. And through the circumstances of our lives to do what God has called us to do. I watch sometimes, I know people, you watch people who live for God, walk with God. You see people that uh, have a relationship with God that are strong spiritual people. Don't waver in their faith. And it seems like every time they turn around, they're bombarded with another problem. And, you, and, and it's human nature, Brother Bolt, to ask, my God, somebody who is so faithful, somebody who is so willing to give, Somebody who is so strong, why are they always in a valley? You ever, you ever wonder that? Are you, or am, I, am I crazy? You see people that, man, what a great preacher he is. What a, what a kind pastor he is. What a, what a great worship leader she is or whatever. You know, what a great, whatever it is that they do in the kingdom of God. How awesome they are. And it just seems like, bam, one valley. 
They get out of that valley. Bam, they're in another valley. Those things work in our lives to prepare us sometimes for what God's called us to do. It's not easy sometimes, the, the burden that we have to bear. It's not easy, but God gives us direction and God will prepare us for the things that are going to happen so that we can be witnesses of his goodness. I'm going to tell you probably the greatest witness that we can have is when we go through a trial and our faith doesn't waver and people see us in that valley and our faith is still strong in God. That's a witness to the power of prayer in a person's life. It's what it is. It's a witness to God's goodness. Mark Batterson's an author. He wrote a book called Chase the Lion. And he talks about his personal belief that as Christians and followers of Jesus Christ, we have two destinies. The first destiny is universal to all of us. And we're all called and destined to be like him. Uh, Romans 8 and 29 tells us whom he did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. Within, within every one of us, uh, we have unique giftings that give us direction for living our lives in the image of God. We were created in his image. I talked about it a little bit Thursday. I probably didn't really teach it as well as I, as I studied it. You know, sometimes there are things that you study and you think, man, that's great. That really makes sense. And then when you try to put it on paper and teach people, when I went home and I sat down and I looked at my notes, I thought, wow, I should have stayed with my notes and not tried to ramble as much. Other times I really do better rambling and not sticking to my notes. Thursday, I probably should have stuck to my notes a little better. But uh, we've been given, God, God, we were made in the image of God. And, and when we live for God, and when we do the will of God, we're as close to God as we're ever going to be. And as much like God as we're ever going to be. We cannot walk our lives, live our lives, and walk in this world and in our lives using our mind and our intellect and our emotions to be the driving force in our life. We were created to be led by the Spirit. I've said it before. In every man, in every human being, there is this God-shaped hole in, in our soul. There's this, there's this hole that's shaped like God. Whatever that, whatever that shape is, it's, it's, it's shaped like God. And when you put God in that hole, when God's Spirit fills that hole, it fills that hole completely. There's no leaks. If you shine the light on the other side of it, the light doesn't shine through. There's no leaks. But what we try to do is we try to pack all kinds of things in it. You know, this God-shaped hole is round, and we take all these square pegs, and we, we try to cram them in there. And we may fill that hole. We think we got that hole filled. We can't put one more thing in that hole. But when we shine the light of God on it, between every one of the pegs that we put in there, there's gaps that aren't full. So the joy that God wants us to have is always leaking out through that God-shaped hole because the only thing, thing that will fill that void in our lives is the Spirit of God. And so if we're going to get direction in our life, it's got to be by the Spirit of God. That's why we can't, and I'm not, I, you know, I don't want to tell, I, I would rather, I'm a nice guy. I like things to flow easy and smooth. I don't like waves. I don't like to make people mad. I just like everything to be smooth and easy. I'd like to be able to tell you, just do the best you can. Come when you can be here. If you can't be here, I understand. You know, I'd like to be able to tell you, you know, if you live in all the light that you know, just live in that light. I'd like to be able to tell you, you know, you don't have to give up everything. God sees the struggles that you have, and he knows your weaknesses, and he knows you got problems. And he's, he's sympathetic to all of that. I'd like to be able to tell you that's the case. 
But when we try to live our lives through our mind and our emotions and our understanding, that's the mindset that we get. But that's not the way God wants us to live. God wants us to live led by the Spirit. And when we're led by the Spirit, there is a drive that God puts in us. And that drive strives to be more like Jesus. And, the, and, and one of the greatest attributes of Jesus is faithfulness. And so it's not okay for us to just get here when we feel like it. Uh, Brother Hunt used to preach there's only two times to be at church, when you feel like it and when you don't. You know, Brother Hunt used to say there's only one excuse for you not to be here if you die on the way. Right? So there's this driving force. The Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God, directs our lives. And when it does, it ever leads us closer to God. So there's something inside of us when we're spirit-led that's never satisfied with only doing what our flesh can do. We realize that to be led by the Spirit means that we walk in the Spirit. And when we walk in the Spirit, we strive. Paul said, I strive. I press. More than once, Paul said, I fight my flesh. Paul talked about it a lot. He said, I strive to walk. He said, I press toward the mark of the high calling of God. Paul said, in my memory, there's a war. My flesh wants to do one thing, but my spirit leads me another way. And so in order for me to please God and to be the child of God and to fulfill the life that God wants me to live, I've got to press my way in. Because the devil has made it his goal to destroy us. So but we've got giftings. Every one of us have got giftings to live the life that God's called us. Mark Batterson said it this way, be like Christ, be yourself. That's your double destiny. You can be yourself and be like Jesus. So we walk in a double destiny. That's an empowerment that we get to be his witnesses. And it takes on a, a whole new meaning. Direction. Direction becomes more specific. Instead of just the magnificent direction of God for our lives, we receive direction not just for our lives, but we receive direction for the day. We receive direction for the hour. And sometimes we receive direction for the moment. It's, God vo it's God's voice talking to us like he did Isaiah in Isaiah 30 and 21. This is the way. Walk ye in it. Because direction's important. Direction's important. We live in Indianapolis, right? We live in Indianapolis. If I want to go to St. Louis, which direction am I heading? West. How come I'm not going to go east? Why can't I go east? I want to go to St. Louis, but I don't want to go that way. It's the wrong way. I can't go north and get to St. Louis? What if I got on a plane? Because I like it warmer and it's warmer. I want to go to St. Louis, but I like it where it's warm. What if I got on a plane and went to San Juan, Puerto Rico? Can I get, can I hop in my car then from Puerto Rico and get to St. Louis? Because direction's important. It matters the direction that we take. We can't allow our vision to not have some direction in it. In Proverbs 11.30, tucked into a vision of, of, of righteousness, we find this, this, this jewel in, in, in Proverbs 11.30. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. We're talking about righteousness. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. And he that winneth souls is wise. Just in, out of nowhere, you know, it's like, that's kind of like, sometimes the wise man reminds me a lot of Ashley, my daughter Ashley. You know, Ashley will be talking about something. Ashley can just be in the middle of a conversation. Squirrel! You know? 
The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. Squirrel. And he that wins the souls is wise. But that's tucked in there specifically for a purpose. It's not directly referring to the saving of lost souls. The truth presented by the writer in Proverbs still speaks to us in our pursuit of reaching the lost. Wisdom is what leads us to understand that we've got to examine ourselves and prepare ourselves to become God's witnesses. Direction requires preparation. I got to know where I want to go and how I got to get there. I'm trying to just break this down for people who are simple-minded like me. I got to know where I want to go and how I'm going to get there. Direction requires that I prepare myself. I can't just get in the car, go down to Pendleton Pike, and when I get there, decide, well, I want to go to St. Louis. I think I'm going to turn left. I'm going the wrong way. When before, so technology, we talked about earlier, technology changing. Before GPS came out, so when GPS units came out, I can't remember, it's not Garmin, I can't remember what the name of it was, but there was one that was made. No, it wasn't even that one. It was even before the Tom Tom. But anyway, it was when I made like nine or ten dollars an hour. But GPS came out, and I had to have one. I had to have one. And back then, this baby was like $1,200. I didn't tell my wife. I just bought it. And she said, well, that's pretty cool. How much does that cost? Oh, it doesn't matter. It's going to get us everywhere. It'll get us everywhere. Uh, so, you know, it had the little thing, the little suction cup that you put on the windshield. And when you touch it, when you tap it, it would, you know, tick. And so anyway, I bought a, I bought a, one of those big bad boys for 1200 bucks. Now you can buy a $99 burner phone and it's got a GPS on it. And your phone is your camera, your flashlight and your GPS, right? And if you don't want a woman telling you what to do, you can change the voice to a man or vice versa. But before all of that came out, we belonged to AAA. And when we would travel somewhere, we would get a trip tick. Anybody know what a trip tick is? Pages about that wide and about that long. And it would be about a 50-mile trek on there. And you could flip from one page to the next. And I could get all the way from here to Galveston, Texas with a trip tick. Did it one time. And, uh, man, you know, so in order for me to know how to get from here to Galveston, I would take the time to go to AAA, tell them I was going. They would chart it. They, even though it's on the page, they would still take a highlighter and highlight the route. They would find out where there was road construction, and they would mark in a different colored uh, highlighter where there was road construction so we would know. We were prepared to go the direction that we needed to go. I don't hardly go anywhere anymore that I don't put the GPS on in my car. I've been to the United, the UPC headquarters. I've been there a hundred times. I've been there 10 times since they moved to Weldon Springs. I know how to get there. I know what I got to do. I know how to get there. And I don't know why. I guess other than that I've programmed it into my mind that I have to pre prepare for direction. Because every time I go to headquarters, Brother Vault, I plug it into my GPS. Because I know that if I want to get somewhere, I've got to have direction. When Paul wrote to the Romans... He noted that we must mind or we've got to think on or pay attention to things of the spirit rather than things of the flesh. John reminded us in 1 John 2 that we've got to love the Father and not the world or the things that are in the world. If any man love the Father, love the world, the, 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 the Father's not in him. A worldly mindset 
results in a life that invites the scrutiny of the world. A godly mindset invites the presence and the power of God. Our witness stands firm in the face of any outside examination when we've examined ourselves to make sure that we're motivated, motivated by the love of God and the direction of the Holy Ghost in our lives. If we want to be a Christian, basic, fundamental, elementary, Christian living 101. If we want to be a Christian, we got to have direction. First, we have to have vision. If we're going to have vision, we got to have direction. If we're going to have direction, we got to have preparation. Uh, sometimes I wonder if I'm going to move on through these because I'm taking some of these. There's where we'll stop. I come in, I, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm just telling you because we're talking about direction this morning. On Thursday nights before church on Thursday, uh, I get here between 4.30 and 5 o'clock. I've already studied. I've already got my, either my message or my Bible study all laid out. I've already done my, either my PowerPoint or my handout or sometimes, if you're lucky, both. Right? I've already got them all done. They're all done. But I like to get here and get in my office and sit in my chair and get my lesson out and look at it and read through it and make sure that I got everything all in, in order. And I want to make sure that I got all the announcements done. And we make sure that we got the musicians get here uh, 6.30 and they make sure they know what songs we're going to sing and what we're doing and who's singing and what's going on. Because we have a direction. We know where we want to go. We want to get closer to God. We want to we want to plan a purpose. And so rather than just show up and just go through the motions, we plan it. On Sunday mornings, I'm here between 8 and 8.30. I come in, I turn on all the lights, turn on all the speakers. Make sure the heat's on. The heat's on. It's 69 in here. That's warmer than I keep my house. <laughs> but we turn, we turn all that on. I make sure the announcements are all ready. Go in. Same thing on Sunday morning. My message was ready. Uh, my message was ready six months ago for, for today. Now, that's not always the same, but that's not always the case. But for the Christmas thing that we're doing, I was ready six months ago for what I'm preaching this morning. I had PowerPoints. I got the PowerPoints uh, all put together when we got back from our cruise to the Baltics because some of my pictures on my PowerPoints are from St. Petersburg, Russia. I'm giving you little tidbits here of, of what, what I'm going to uh, preach about this morning. But I had all that, all that's, all that's done, all that was ready. Notes were ready, PowerPoint was ready. All that was ready. Zane, I got it. I got it to Zane this morning. Uh, I tried to email it because we we usually email things back and forth, but my um, PowerPoint was seventy three megs, and my email will only move twenty five megs. So I told Zane I needed a thumb drive to put my PowerPoint because it was too big, and Zane said he thought instantly. He thought, "Oh my God, seventy three megs. We're going to be here forever. He's never going to finish." And then when he opened it up, he saw, oh, thank God, it's all pictures. That's why it's such a big file. And uh, we chuckled. But I kept notes of that, and I remember that, that he said that. <laughs> so, I, you know, just things that I wanted, we, we want to do. We, we um, I don't even know if everybody knows this or not, but we, we're we not trying to program God out. God can take control anytime God wants to take control. But we've got a plan. We've got an outline of the service. We've got the announcements on there. So we know what we're doing. We've got a plan so that we don't just get up and fumble through things and make God think that we're taking this thing lightly. It's serious. It's living for God, working for God. It's a serious thing. So I want God to know I'm serious about what I'm doing. And we should do that in every aspect of our life, living for God. God, I want God to know I'm serious about this. I'm not taking this for granted. I'm going to talk to him every day. I want my wife to know I love her, so I talk to her every day. 
We don't take each other for granted. We talk every day. Same should be with God. We've got to prepare for this. Once we're spiritually prepared to be empowered as witnesses, once that happens in our lives, God begins to give us spiritual direction for people that are seeking Him. But we've got to be prepared to be empowered witnesses. God, once we prepare ourselves, God's not going to talk to you and tell you what you need to do if you don't talk to God. You're going to struggle in your relationship with God if you don't talk to Him, if you don't deny your flesh. We fast. I'll probably sometime do a a, a little series on fasting because I don't really talk enough about fasting, I don't think. I probably haven't talked enough about what fasting is and the purpose of fasting. But but when we fast, we deny our flesh. We've got to deny our flesh. We've got to put our flesh under subjection to the Spirit. 90% or better of the purpose of fasting is to subdue the flesh so that the Spirit can be stronger. That's effectively the purpose of fasting. If you can fast... If you can fast, then you can overcome any obstacle in your life. That's a big statement to make in Sunday school on a Sunday morning. But if you've got the strength, the spiritual fortitude to fast, you can overcome any obstacle that the devil tries to throw your way. He lies to you. Because, see, all of these things... Might as well talk about this as anything else. All of these food is required for you to physically survive. None of the dalliances and the indulgences that we give our body are required for us to survive. They're not. You don't need all the other stuff to survive. But if you don't eat, you'll die. So if you can prove to your flesh that over the course of whatever, two days, three days, five days, seven days, God can sustain you while you don't eat, then you've got the power to be able to tell the devil, I don't need any of that junk that you throw. If God can sustain me for seven days while I deny my flesh the ability to eat and provide the, the nourishment that I need to physically survive, devil, you are a liar, and I don't need that stuff in my life. And, and, and we, don't, we don't really spend a lot of time talking about that aspect of fasting, but that is, that is the strength of fasting. And when we realize that, then that helps to give us spiritual insight to be able to be what God wants us to be. And we can fast then for things that we need to talk to God about or things that are in our family or things that are in our lives that we want victory over. Because when I gain victory over my flesh, then I can gain victory over all of these things that are not necessary to my physical being. None of the rest of it that I fight, none of the battles that I fight are necessary. I'm telling you, none of the other battles that I fight are necessary for my physical life. None of them. I don't need them to survive, but I've got to have that food in order for me to survive. So I've got to prepare. I have to prepare to be what God wants me to be. And once we become empowered, there's... Two outstanding examples of this spiritual direction that are found in the book of Acts. At the beginning of last week's lesson, we talked about Cornelius and Peter. Cornelius prayed diligently, and God heard him and answered. Cornelius sent men to find Peter, and while they were knocking on the door downstairs, Peter was on the roof, and God was talking to him. Another example uh, is the story of the Ethiopian eunuch that's found in Acts chapter 8. It starts with the direction uh, in in Acts chapter 8 and 26. And the angel of the Lord appeared uh, and spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south 
unto the way that the that that goeth down from Jerusalem into Gaza, which is the desert. The direction from the angel was very specific. You got to get up and you got to go towards the south. And you got to make your way to the way that goes from Jerusalem to Gaza in the desert. Don't go another way. God's got a plan for you. God's not always going to tell you what the plan is. But he'll always give you direction on how to get where he wants you to go. And so he talked to Philip and he told him that. And Philip was obedient and he went to the place that he was directed. And he found a man on a chariot there. And when Philip caught up with the chariot, he heard the man reading from the book of Isaiah. And there in the desert, they began to walk together. And Philip asked him, do you know what you read or what you're reading? And the man said, how can I know? I don't have anybody to explain it to me. And he began to preach to him Jesus. And when they came to water, the eunuch said, here's water. Baptize me. And Philip baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip. The Bible said so that the eunuch saw him no more. But he went his way rejoicing. Spiritual direction leads us to the exact time and the exact place where somebody that needs a word from God are at. Had a friend this morning. Um, I got a friend this morning that not a close friend, not somebody that I talk to all the time, not somebody that I talk to every week. In fact, I don't know how long it's been since I talked to him on the phone. But he texted me this morning, and he said, the Lord spoke to me this morning in prayer and told me that I needed to give you this word from God. And I'm going to tell you, it was just what I needed for where I am today. Because sometimes we pray, oh God, I don't know what I'm going to do now. Oh God, I don't know where I'm going to go now. And somebody else is praying, oh God, if I can help somebody, lead me. And so when we pray, oh God, I need help right now. And somebody else says, oh God, let me help somebody right now. God directs me this way, God directs him that way, and our paths intersect with a word from God. Because direction is important. Direction is important. He pastors a church. He's got 100 people he's got to minister to this morning. He didn't have time to, to give me a word. He's got a lot of people that he's got to take care of. But direction is important when we're walking with God. And God will direct every one of us. It'd be, wouldn't it be a great, well, Brother Long, you're going to have to be careful because if you start teaching that kind of stuff, everybody in the church is going to have a good word for somebody. Man, wouldn't that be a problem? Instead of people talking on the phone every day to somebody about all the nasty stuff that's going on and telling everybody all everybody else's business, wouldn't it be an awful thing if instead we just called each other up and said, I got a word from God for you. God's going to fight your battles. God's going to make a way for you. God's going to open doors for you. Man, I, I'd hate to pastor a church like that. I'd hate to pastor a church where everybody always talked to God and everybody lived right and everybody tried to help people. That wouldn't be any fun. I wouldn't have to spend all, I wouldn't get to spend all my time talking to people about problems that they've got because they don't pray. Direction's important. And we get direction by being prepared. We've got to prepare to do this. And as empowered witnesses of the gospel, we encounter people who are first and foremost in need of salvation. Secondly, in need of direction for themselves. And if I've walked the road, let's stand, I'm going to quit. And if I've walked the road and God's led me down the road that they're going, and God's made a way for me when I didn't think there was a way, then I can be an encouragement to them if I've prepared myself and I have direction. Because God gives us that empowerment to be witnesses. Ye shall, when he gave them the Holy Ghost, are you sure, Brother Lord? When he gave them the Holy Ghost, the promise of the gift of the Holy Ghost 
You'll be endued with power from on high. You're going to get the Spirit of God. And you shall be witnesses of me. We're supposed to be witnesses of the goodness of God so that we can help other people in the, in the direction that they need. Our lives can be directed like Peter's and Philip's when we pray to be sowers of love in the presence of hatred that's in the world all around us. But we've got to make up our mind. I want God to lead me. I want God to guide me. And if we'll do that, we'll seek his direction. We'll seek his providence and we'll seek his will. And when we prepare our hearts, God will give us direction and we'll be what God wants us to be. We're going to take about 10 minutes, 12 minutes, and at about 11 o'clock, we're going to start morning worship. Thank you for being attentive in Sunday school, uh, coffee shop, whatever you want to do, see somebody you don't know, introduce yourself to them, and we'll start morning worship right at 11. God bless you.